Well, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Mark Nykirk, uh, director of the Scripps Howard Center for Civic Engagement here at NKU, and welcome to another session for the Experiential Learning Week at NKU. Uh, we are going to focus this morning on service learning uh, and uh, the office, our office at, uh, uh, here is um, a pr primary su supporter of uh, service learning uh, at NKU. And uh, uh, we sometimes tell both uh, uh, faculty on campus and the community that our, uh, we sort of like the match.com of community engagement. If you are uh, uh, teaching a class and looking for a community partner, we can help you with that. Or if you are a community partner, a nonprofit, for example, looking to partner with a class, uh, we can um, help you uh, um, uh, find a, a class that you can uh, work with. NKU has approximately 100 to 120 service learning uh, classes every year across all colleges and many of our departments. Um, and you can see here that when we think about service learning, this is how we think of it uh, in these sort of uh, categories. Uh, the idea essentially is to find a community-based project that um, uh, aligns with the learning outcomes of the class uh, so that uh, there's benefit to the community in terms of uh, uh, something uh, deliverable, if you will, but also benefit to our students uh, so that the experiential component allows you to uh, learn your coursework uh, more uh, deeply. And uh, the um, uh, what we're going to do this morning is focus on uh, uh, two classes, one from the fall semester and one that's ongoing right now in the spring semester that have had service learning projects. Uh, two very different kinds of projects, uh, one in the School of the Arts and one in the College of Informatics. Uh, but I uh, give you a little bit of example of uh, how this works. And uh, so those of you who are uh, uh, with us who are students, uh, um, I hope you have the uh, opportunity while at NKU to do service learning uh, uh, class. So they tend to be uh, uh, pretty great experiences for uh, students uh, in terms of uh, applying the knowledge that's learned in the classroom. Those of you who may be with us who are from uh, nonprofits and other community partners, um, uh, have a look at what these two specific ones are, but if you have an idea for a project that you think might uh, work, uh, please uh, let us know at uh, engage at NKU is a simple way with an email, but if you also go to uh, the Scripps Howard website, there's a portal where you can describe a potential project and we will uh, uh, see if that works for a, uh, a class and uh, be in communication with you. Uh, we're going to have two presentations and a little bit of time at the end for questions. And I want to get started with uh, 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 Professor Kevin Mente, who teaches uh, painting uh, and has done a number of projects in the community uh, that uh, he and his students will uh, uh, talk to you about. And again, keep in mind that we are trying to provide something of value to the community while also helping uh, to teach the class in a more effective uh, way. Professor Mente. Thanks, Mark. So as I'm pulling this up, I'll give you a brief history. Can everybody see the slides? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. So in the beginning, you guys are gonna get a whole story of service learning in my courses. I have a materials and techniques class that I thought a component of service learning would really benefit the students and benefit the community. In fall of 2018, I met with Mark and he had this idea for some murals outside of the Southgate Street School in Newport. It had to be history themed and what I had to consider what would be important and what would be exciting to depict in some murals. How do I get the students on board? If you've ever taught any classes and you mentioned that there's going to be a group project to the students, they usually, you might hear some of them moan because some people don't pull their own weight. So I have to consider that as well when I'm making the syllabus up. And then how do I cherry pick from the pillars of service learning that you guys just saw to merge with my course because the only part 
that we do that's service learning is only two weeks out of my entire course. So I made some digital sketches based on what I heard would be important and what excited me. And I met with some people in terms of what was some, some things I should consider for painting murals in Newport. I tried not to get anything too controversial. And then I took action. I projected and sketched out four ideas on four foot by eight foot panels dealing with the history of Newport as it related to the floods, gangsters, that was a pretty fun one, but the fire department and the school for African American students. Teaching the students about teamwork and independence and students aren't big fans of group projects as I mentioned. So I had to figure out a way to make sure that students were still learning independently working on their work as well as joining a team. And there are several things that they learn. One was to reflect on different aspects of the human condition as they learn to paint. Students became invested in the project. Sherman's mom modeled for the teacher. And so people kind of wanted Sherman to work on her, but there's so much work to go around that they have to also work on painting other aspects as well as her. So they grew up Sherman's mom, so they did better because of that. I'm also trying to give them professional experience and they're able to add these projects to their resume. As an art paint, as an art student and as a professional painter, I've known this question very often, or I've heard this question asked very often. How do you paint blank? As an artist and as a student, you're always trying to figure those things out. And that's part of the world of art. So as artists, we have to figure out those questions our entire lives. In this case, the students had to learn how to paint girders and they had to learn how to paint the water scenes and like that's one of the biggest questions through the 20th century in terms of how do you paint water well they did a pretty good job and they learned how to do it these projects also boosted their confidence and for a few of the students it led to future art and mural commissions so i'm trying to set them up for success and some of the students got to do paintings in other parts of the northern kentucky and greater Cincinnati um, area after doing these mural commissions. Gina Arardi, pictured here, went on to do more mural work for Newport. One of the best things and one of the most rewarding things about experimental, experiential warrant learning is after you've made your product, after you've made your deliverable, people see it and often you get congratulated for it. And there's something that runs much deeper in that type of experience than just simply making a work of art and the only people that see it are in the classroom. So recognition from the community in this case, the Newport Fire Department, and I'll tell you, that's hot. That's supposed to be a joke. <laughs> Maybe that joke isn't that hot. Um, but having the firefighters come up to the students and say, thank you for depicting our, our department and the history of our department. I think that was really a moving and rewarding experience for a lot of my students. And then the fire department gets to see all of their brethren and all of their history depicted in that particular mural. So fall 2021, let's make some more murals. I talked with Mark in the summer and he sent out feelers to the community for mural projects. By mid fall, we had two takers, Roebling Point Books and Coffee at their new Newport location and Clark Park in Newport. 
here we have some in progress paintings or we have the mural in progress you can see some of the students in the upper right hand corner are mixing paint while others are applying it and then there's also a good opportunity for students to kind of work next to each other and discuss what they're doing as well as for me to point out things that we need to address and think about. I will say that we did maybe break the social distancing aspect, which unfortunately came with the, the project. Our murals were four feet by eight feet and we always wore our mask and, but that we're just going to kind of get in each other's way a little bit because there's just only so much room for us to make these paintings. You might be interested in how to make a mural in two weeks. Well, one, the community has to trust you. And how does that happen? First, you have to prove yourself. And I think that in this case, for this semester, we already had some of those previous murals under our belt and we said, look, this is what we can deliver. Please trust that we can do a good job. And also we don't wanna to get too caught up in the red tape of committees and having things approved by too many people. That always takes a little bit of time. You also don't wanna to give too many options because then you go back and forth, go back and forth. So I gave a couple of sketches to the different clients and they approved it and then we set to work. When you start to wed the community's vision with your own, it sets up a great synergy because now you're, you're both invested, you're both partners in the success of this project. I had to use technology or we had to use technology to save time. If we were merely to draw this out old school, it would take a lot longer. But once the, once the sketches were approved, I projected those and quickly traced the stuff. And so the students just can kind of come in and paint. It also makes mural painting more affordable. Everybody wants murals. But then once they find out the cost, it really makes them gun shot. So the fact that Scripps Howard program pays for some of the, or pays for all of the, the, the paint makes this a lot more affordable for communities to get murals. All students are held individually accountable through photo documentation. Remember earlier I talked about how when you have a group project, sometimes there are those students that don't pull their own weight, but it's very hard to have documentation as to what each student did. The students were required to take photos of when they sat down to paint and what they would finish in their painting session. So they constantly had this log or this diary of what they were contributing to the project. And it was a good way for me to check their work to make sure everybody was moving along and doing what they needed to do. It also shifts the student's own perceptions from being a student to performing like professionals. When that switch goes on, you can see real improvement in the students because they know that they have to perform at a higher level. And then you find the right people for the right jobs and have them raise the overall quality. So maybe my students will talk about that. We have one person, Jasmina, who was really great at painting flowers. And then Siri was really good at painting faces. And Chloe was really good at mixing up colors. So everybody's working together and we have learners teaching other learners. I don't know if there's another thing I can't see on my screen. If, is there, oh, is there one more thing in it that I, I'm missing right now? Oh yeah, personal pride. As artists, I hope that each student that comes through my classroom 
develops a sense of personal pride. When they make something, I want them to be invested in it. And I want them to show the world what they've made. Here we have the students in front of the finished mural before it went out into the world. That's the mural in its entirety. We basically borrowed from Michelangelo's painting of the creation of Adam from the Sistine, from the Sistine Chapel, and we replaced it with a book. And then here's the Clark Park mural. The one student in the background who's pointing at the mural itself where it says Clark Park, his name is John Clark. So he demanded that ownership of that particular part of the mural. <laughs> I wanna thank Richard Hunt of Roebling Point uh, Books and Coffee for trusting us to make a mural for his beautiful coffee shop. I hope you guys get to go there and read in the reading room and then maybe glance up and take a look at our mural every once in a while. Park, and that sounds kind of creepy actually when you say it like that, but it's a place where they have performances and they also have community gardens. And so I thought what better way to merge the music with the with the plants. And then Jim Parker on NKU's building services crew, he helped install these and Mark Nykirk and all of his personnel for getting all of this lined up. And lastly, the students, because without the students, these paintings would not get done. With that being said, I'm gonna turn the mic over to Siri Reuter behind me and um, I'll let him uh, talk about his experience. Hi, everybody. I want to talk a little bit to the experience of actually working on this mural with my peers uh, in terms of the logistics of uh, completing it. So above all, the mural was an exercise in cooperation. The logistics of completing a painting with a dozen participants is not like uh, working with a team of researchers to complete a project or working on an assembly line uh, in a factory. The way I have equated it is uh, it is very similar to having a dozen cook, having a dozen cooks work on a soup. <laughs> I, I promise I'll defend this analogy. So inevitably, you're going to have different cooks with different specializations, and you're going to have some cooks that uh, we'll argue about how to cut potatoes. Some cooks that will insist the uh, soup be vegetarian. Some of these cooks will be bakers and they're gonna move forward very trepidatiously for they have not made soup before. Um, I think that when you involve a dozen cooks in the creation of a soup, Kevin really likes food analogies. I made this just for him. Uh, when you involve a dozen cooks, in the creation of this massive hypothetical pot of soup, you run the risk of making decent soup instead of very good soup. And the only way you can make good soup in this scenario is if everyone sticks to their specializations and uh, follows direction. And that was a very, very important and pers uh, persistent part of this as we moved forward. So artists are uniquely inconsistent people, and that's what makes this uh, uh, problematic. Art as a, as a nature is problem solving and different people solve problems different ways and with different mediums. A very good example of this is uh, the medium that we had to do for this, uh, for these two murals, which was acrylic paint. Uh, for uh, the logistics of this presentation, our working timeline, how quickly we needed paint to dry and uh, elements of its presentation, it needed to be acrylic paint, which is all well and fine but none of us specialized in acrylic paint. Uh, we were all outside of our niche. So imagine a room of carpenters and uh, metal workers being forced to pour concrete. We were all at a disadvantage. And so uh, divorced from the comfort of our principal mediums, we were left with our specializations. So like Kevin mentioned, Jasmina, who's a tremendous botanical painter, immediately set up camp in the bushes. <laughs> 
and it was tremendous. She, so she worked on those. I have a background in portraiture. Uh, so immediately I got to work on faces and figures. And uh, that was a big part of how we completed this and how uh, divorced from the comfort of our aforementioned uh, principal mediums, uh, we made this uh, to the best quality that we could complete. Um, I noticed also that there was a real camaraderie of uh, competition that existed while we were working on this. And it was all respectful and it was in, the, in good faith of uh, making sure that we're all working uh, to the best of our ability. And uh, a lot of that uh, professionalism that I saw from my peers took the form of delegation and diligence. Diligence, uh, Kevin covered, and the fact that we all had to put in our work um, outside of class and inside of class uh, to make sure that we were doing our part. And delegation took the form of uh, some humility that uh, we all had to practice sometimes realizing um, what we could and couldn't paint. I remember distinctly um, working on some hands during the Sistine Chapel painting that were just doing terribly. I, I'm an abysmal hands painter. And uh, remembering one of my peers who had uh, just earlier completed a very good painting of some hands, I remember stopping him outside of class and begging him to fix my hands. <laughs> Delegation was a massive part of this. Um, but overall, I think that this uh, mural was a unique opportunity to engage with my peers, to really get to know them. Because uh, uh, although it was somewhat of a high strung environment, we were all very focused. It was also uh, an environment that was home to some of the most um, entertaining and profound discussion I've had in art school. You got a real sense of everyone's character who was listening to podcasts, who was uh, <laughs> cracking jokes, who was complaining about the quality of YouTube's music. Um, it was a very it was a very profound experience for us and uh, beyond the actual element of getting to work and getting to put our stuff out into the community. I think, uh, I think it was just a good way to get to know the people we work with, get to have a good experience with them. Overall, I think we made very good soup. Thank you. Okay, I'll go next. All right, go ahead and introduce yourself. I'm Chloe Winger. Um, the mural project was a really good experience um, working with public art uh, for the community. Um, through this, I learned how to work with a group of painters. I've never worked uh, in a group painting group project before. That's not something that normally comes across in a, in a painting course, but it's, it was a really nice experience to have. But um, through this, I learned how to function through communication, cooperation, and respect for one another. Um, Kevin really set us up for success uh, with the projects by priming the, we use drywall uh, to paint on and, and having the outline all done so we can immediately begin uh, painting. Um, he also helped us out by introducing acrylics to us for, for a small project right before the mural. So we're a little familiar with the medium, not like too familiar, but as new as one can be for working a week in advance uh, before the project. But we learned how to make our own acrylics. We learned about mixing the mediums. Um, so it was really easy to jump immediately into painting the murals. Um, we use drywall because that's normally, that would hold up best for the environments they were going in. Um, and normally with murals, drywall is going to be the most common um, canvas to work on. Um, but none of us have a whole lot of experience on painting on drywall. I certainly didn't. And it was, um, an interesting challenge to overcome. Um, but every class we would alternate between paintings. So everyone had experience with both paintings. Um, everyone kind of, as Siri said, had their own specializations. Um, I specialized in mixing paints and skin tones. So I wanted to call a specific area, but the thing is, is that I work a little too slow. Um, and one of my classmates noticed this, and uh, this was a really noteworthy um, experience that happened, is that he made the suggestion, well, why don't you mix up the skin tones and we could do the block in, and then you can go back over and refine it. And um, that really meant a lot. It made me feel respected as an artist. Um, and it was also a uh, uh, really uh, it was beneficial for the whole group to work faster and it was a good um, um, 
example of cooperation between one another. Um, this uh, is a major component uh, to this project was also having a positive attitude. Um, if a classmate wasn't in the headspace to create that morning, I was frustrated, you know, it, it would it'd make it a little bit awkward. But again, communication is a really essential part of, of the mural and being able to talk to one another. And um, it's just really important to feel comfortable um, with one another and, and working together, painting, um, playing music and keeping an open dialogue kept everyone in a good mood. Um, it would strengthen everyone's bond as well, keeping that constant communication. Even coming in outside of class, I would always run into another classmate and it was really easy to talk to them and, and just, you know, keep conversation going, distracting ourselves while painting at the same time. Um, and it, it made the painting go a lot easier, uh, but overall it was a wonderful learning experience and what it's like to work with multiple painters. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jasmina Robinhawk. Um, so my peers actually covered a good portion of it. So I kind of wanted to talk about like that concept of how to, uh, the experience of like questioning how you paint something. I think we, as artists, that is a question that's constantly asked. And one of the things that really helped with this project is, as Siri mentioned, we all have our strengths and we all definitely have our weaknesses. And so it was really cool to go up to somebody and say, hey, you paint this really well. How can I learn from you? Can I watch you do this? Um, so being able to work on this project with a total of eight students and we really got to become a family. We got to become an artist community, um, working with artists that I admire their techniques and their skill sets that are different from my own. And it was an experience that, you know, I can incorporate it in my own practice outside of this environment. Um, so it was, it was definitely very rewarding and the humility and direction of being able to work with the group was absolutely pertinent to the overall experience um, and being able to see the pieces actually go out into the public and how people see it. I know the Clark Park, I took my friends out there because we were driving past and I halted my car. I was like, oh my gosh, that's my mural. And you know, the exciting thing of being able to see something that you participated in is rewarding in its own, but watching the people, like even your friends and family who do support you, um, see it and then just light up and go, no way, you did this, you did this with a group of people. It looks like it was done by one person. Um, was was really, really cool to watch. And then we went to the Roebling bookstore and uh, hearing Richard Hunt talk about how he was really concerned with putting in a place that was visible for everybody else um, and how he was absolutely just thrilled at the mural and so excited to have something in the community such as that. Um, yeah, it just, I don't know, like being able to give back to the community and giving the opportunity of the how to uh, give into the community with your art was absolutely just one of the most rewarding experiences. Um, yeah. Good. All right. Well, uh, thank you, uh, everybody. And I think you can, uh, uh, those of you watching, you can see that uh, the, the value of. Uh, of taking the classroom into the community and uh, how the learning outcomes have uh, are accentuated by uh, this uh, uh, practice. Uh, I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, Professor De Blasio. He is teaching. Uh, we're in a, a real time situation here because the class that he's teaching is uh, this semester, so they're in uh, uh, a little uh, um, moving along with this project. And this is in a public relations uh, cases and campaigns class. Uh, and uh, um, this class has a history of uh, finding community clients. Uh, so uh, the experiential component is uh, recurring, but each semester is a different project, different client. And Greg, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, I, and um, thank you for the uh, 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 presentation about that the painting. I, I kind of appreciate the food analogies too. Um, it, it makes me think of, um, uh, a, a statistical study that uh, I think it was Domino's Pizza. Uh, they did all these experiments and surveys about uh, the kind of pizza, the, the best pizza that they could make. And of course, after weeks and weeks of uh, surveys and experimenting, they came up with the most marvelously mediocre pizza you can imagine. 
So um, yeah, so thanks for <laughs> warning us about that, that kind of approach. It often doesn't work. So it's great that you had success with it. Well, first, um, I, I want to thank Mark as well. Um, often we have uh, clients that um, uh, approach us well before the start of the semester. Um, coming into the spring semester, th there were several people, uh, several organizations that it seemed they were going to be good matches for us to work with, but it, it didn't turn out for one reason or another. So um, <clears throat> uh, Mark suggested the, the current client that we're working with, and um, we, we follow a regular schedule when we do this, and, and I'll, I'll talk more about that later when we get into the specifics about the client, but um, I'll, I'll just give you some background about how, not just how this class works with clients, but, but some others. And, and um, to, to kind of show you how real time this is, uh, just yesterday, I got a phone call from someone who represents a, a foster care agency uh, who wants to work with the class. And, um, you know, we were kind of exploring the, our, our expectations. And, and I said, you know what, uh, tomorrow I have to uh, give a small uh, presentation to a group to kind of explain how this works. Why don't I test it out on you? So, uh, so she said, yeah, that, that, that would work. And, and um, well, I was successful yesterday. Let's see if we uh, have just as much luck today. Okay, so um, first of all, the public relations, um, it, it's, it's hard for us to stay away from controversy. It, it usually, uh, when someone needs some public relations help or counsel, um, it's because there's something that's either going very wrong or something that should go better. So, um, uh, you know, you can think of some examples. Um, we often think of the kinds of cases that are um, prices oriented. Um, one that was in the news the last couple of years was the uh, Boeing 737 MAX um, uh, tragedy. Um, we had a situation where there, were not, there was not one plane crash, but two before the manufacturer, Boeing decided, and the FAA decided to ground the plane. And, and I believe the planes were grounded for more than a year before uh, we could even consider putting them back up in the air for, for very obvious reasons. Um, we can also think about um, uh, new products, uh, why, why uh, sometimes products have a new appeal to us whether it's a certain kind of car, a certain kind of fashion item, a certain place to go on vacation or something like that. Um, and then we think too about reputations. I mean, sometimes um, there is some sort of moral failing that an organization does. They make the wrong decision. Uh, they cause harm. Uh, a physician or a lawyer maybe lost her or his license to practice for a mistake along the way. <clears throat> and, you know, it's something that we wouldn't want uh, the person to suffer for the rest of their lives. So PR counselors, much like lawyers, uh, provide advice as to how to kind of mend uh, the, the thing that went wrong, to kind of, you know, fix your reputation, make an apology, make things right, um, and all that. And, and I want to say at this point, too, that um, people hear the word public relations and they think there's some kind of um, swarmy, you, you know, sleight of hand going on. Um, and that's certainly not the case. Um, everything that's done in public relations is bounded by ethical frameworks that would apply to given context uh, here or there. So um, the client that we're talking about, um, excuse me, the client that we're talking about this semester is the Northern, uh, the emergency shelter of Northern Kentucky. But to give you some background, um, this has been going on in the PR program at NKU for more than 15 years. Um, in the past, we represented all kinds of different organizations that were outside campus. And then we also represented some organizations inside campus that um, had obvious um, outreach initiatives. Uh, for example, the entrepreneurship uh, study program in the business school, um, wondered why they didn't reach um, audiences and educational institutions outside the Cincinnati area. And that was pretty much a simple matter of exerting effort uh, directed toward that, to talking to people in California, to talking to people in, um, in New York City. Um, 
Last semester, the writing class worked with an attorney who uh, provides disability services to people in need and really needed some help in qualifying prospective clients and also um, communicating the services that he provides. And some of the students that are with us today uh, worked on that case. So um, as I said, we're just getting involved with this client. We did have the opportunity to visit the client site, which, which is always a good idea. And it's especially a good idea when um, you consider that we're talking about an emergency shelter for people experiencing homelessness. Um, and just, um, you know, a, a word about shelters. Um, there's a lot of community resistance. Uh, there's, there's a phrase called um, NIMBY, you know, not in my backyard. And this is not the first time that I got involved with a, with a shelter. Um, and the idea that a lot of people have is that if there is a, uh, a shelter in their neighborhood, um, it's a sign that the neighborhood is, you know, taking a left turn and that real estate values are going to go down and all sorts of problems are going to occur because of it. When, you know, in reality, um, that's not the case. Um, every city across America that has had urban studies efforts applied uh, come up with the same conclusion that when a homeless center uh, is, lands in a neighborhood, the real estate values go up. So to, to talk about our approach a little bit, whether it's the emergency shelter or anybody else, we have, uh, we could have as much as 24 students in a class. And that is definitely a lot more than any, a lot more people, a lot more brain power than any PR firm would be willing to throw at a client engagement. So how do we make sense of uh, getting all together, you know, addressing those issues with teamwork that, that, that the you know, previous uh, presentation uh, spoke about so well um, and, and work in an efficient way. Well, in the cases and campaigns class, at least, we, we spend the first um, maybe two thirds of the semester uh, studying stakeholder theory and how stakeholder theory applies to public relations, marketing and communication initiatives generally. So we look at this list here um, this is a way that we might typically work. We say where well, there's, there's our, there are inter internal audiences and there's no organization that's going to do well communicating with outside publics if their inside operations are a little screwy or they just lack the resources to do what they need to do. So that might involve employees and members and volunteers in the case of our, our current uh, client. Um, here we have we have customers, clients, or guests. Uh, again, in the case of an emergency shelter, we, we use the word guests. Um, and then sometimes there are issues that come about because of competition. Um, you know, again, sometimes organizations in the spirit of competition brag about what they do and sort of are hypercritical about what someone else might be doing. Um, then there's the community generally, all right? And community is a very interesting concept. I mean, we're, we're here today to discuss community, but it's not just the communities that are bounded uh, by geography. In fact, this is something that came up in this morning's previous um, uh, uh, meeting, that um, the community has to do with people who share the same interests, who share the same problems, who are experiencing uh, something very profound um, in, in, in common. So we really need to think about that. And the definition of community with this client engagement is very, very particular. Um, we also have another major stakeholder group, which we often call government or the affiliations that um, um, an organization might have with uh, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, uh, professional associations, um, very strong um, alliances that might make up the organization's supply chain or value chain. And then of course the media. And, and when most people think about PR, they think only about the media. You know, they think, oh, well, you know, just write a news release, write a feature story, send it to some media outlet and, you know, keep your fingers crossed. Well, it would be great or, or, or do some activity on social media. Well, you know, it would be great if, if things were that simple 
but it's not. Of course, we rely on our relations with media and media relations and media management is an incredibly important part of public relations, but it's not the only thing. So let's see when we get more into what is going on with this client and how the class might go forward. Well, as I said, we're about two weeks into it. Um, we had a visit from uh, a representative from the client organization. We visited the, the client site, so we have a pretty good understanding of what goes on there. And of course, they're the experts in running a shelter, not us. Our job is to help them or help the client communicate about the effectiveness of and the value of the services that they deliver. So we break it down much the same as the uh, list that you saw previously about different stakeholders. We say, well, we definitely have to deal with guests, all right? And that's the, the most inside um, group of stakeholders that we have, then community, and then these affiliations with government and other organizations that, that, that we have. Now, with this client, um, you know, no client really cares about the academic theory uh, that we apply or the approach. They want, to, they want the job to get done. So this client is focused on when, when she says community, she's really talking about a geographically bounded community around the area of this shelter, which just moved from one area in Covington to another. So her concern, and, and it's definitely a legitimate concern, is that here we are moving into a new neighborhood. Do people really understand what we're all about? Do people understand what we do, the value of our contribution and, and all that? So she's very, very concerned about that. And that's why um, I think, you know, when we talk about guests and government affiliations and the more academic, <clears throat> excuse me, or theoretical uh, idea of community, we really have to keep in mind the way our client sees it. But I, but I think that um, when we determine what's best to do with guests or government, it really will come back to building a stronger uh, relationship with community, which is what, what the client wants. All right, so here's where I'm just describing what goes on and, um, and saying, you know, yes, this client moved into a new neighborhood, um, what's going to happen? What do people think? Um, already there have been a couple of incidents of uh, people throwing uh, beer cans onto the client's property, which is very much uh, contained and well-designed. Um, believe me, I think this facility is, is top drawer. And um, I know I was very impressed and I don't want to speak for all my students, but I know many of them were quite impressed with the, the operation and what they saw there. So th this is a very typical kind of uh, client engagement in that we really we know that, how should I say, that the data, the, the, the moral implications, um, the operational effectiveness, it's all, it's all on the client's side, but still the client sees it as, um, as, an, as an uphill battle, right? And the other interesting thing about this particular client engagement is that um, they're coming off a relationship with a PR firm. Uh, there was a PR firm that um, dedicated um, some pro bono services uh, to help them with the exact transition. You know, okay, we're in this location in Covington, we're moving to another, but the client who has very, is very, very savvy about the communication aspects of, of what she's doing says, well, okay, now we're there, but we're there and it's like a brand new day and we have to make sure that um, you know the, the sun and the wind is at our backs in this new location. And that's what, um, that's what we intend to do. So um, we've had a couple of class meetings. We're going to have more. We're working on, on the project this week. And, and I think this might be a good time to, uh, to turn some of the discussion over to the students that are engaged. Uh, in the project and they can tell you how they're handling this and how they're continuing the tradition of providing PR services within the community as a form of community engagement and service learning. I guess I can go first, you guys. Um, <clears throat> so my name is Abigail. 
I'm currently in the case studies and campaigns class with him working on that assignment, like he said. One thing I do want to mention that the other presentation had mentioned that kind of like stuck with me that kind of works well with our like working with like the student service and everything, even though these are two different like projects is the like how he said the artists are like beginning to feel as if they're professional and like taking the from the student aspect to the professional aspect. And that's one thing that like a lot of these like prospective clients and like clients we've been taking in has given me because I didn't really like grow up around here. So like the networking that comes with like the greater Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky region, I lack in many ways. And like these clients have given me the opportunity to like experience that. Uh, one thing that was also pretty cool is like, like he said, there's so many brain power like going into this and it's kind of hard for us to just be like, oh no, this is the right way. This is the only way. So we do like separate, separate it up into groups. And like, it's very interesting to see where like some of these groups will take it to where like, I didn't even think of those like different aspects. And like, currently I'm working on the guest group for our the emergency shelter. And me and Navea, she's another girl in the class. We were like thinking, well, like, how can we help these guests? Like, we want to go see. And like, Greg set that up for us. We were able to go see. And like, that's something that like, you don't get to do in a normal classroom. And like, you get to like, you know, write these news releases, write these assignments and stuff. But like actually going and hearing that these clients are wanting us to communicate something specific and being able to do that for them has been such a learning experience. And like, I'm like excited, like when he tells us about new clients we could possibly get, like that makes me so excited. And I'm very interested to learn about that new one, Greg. Yeah, I'll go ahead and I'll piggyback off of that as well. Um, hello everybody, my name is Brian. I am also in the guests project, um, I guess, sorry, grouping with Abigail. We are working with uh, Nevea as well. And like going into it, I signed up to be part of like the guest panel and like kind of those aspects because I'm normally like really focused on the community aspects. So like jumping into the project and um, like even touring the facility, I thought we were going to learn a, a, a lot about more of the community surrounding it and like the issues of the community. But I was actually surprised to find out that I learned like more, even more about like the guests and like the guest services they offer and how extremely like hospitable the organization is and just like how and all the services they offer. Like one thing I really, really liked is that they offer like a work program. So when they have guests come and stay with them, they can, you know, they have a program where they can work, they can clean up tables after meals, um, they can clean bathrooms, they can tidy up just around the facility. And within that work program, there's also other services provided to where, you know, they can kind of, services provided to where they can kind of get off their feet, kind of get some help in, you know, either building a resume or getting transportation to go and apply for jobs in the area to kind of, you know, like spark, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm like trying to find the words to say, but just to kind of get off their feet and kind of get back into the working world and kind of where they want to be again. So it's it was really cool to see how much they helped the guest where at first we learned more about the community issues related to it. And I think that was really cool. Yeah, so I will also piggyback off of that. I kind of want to backtrack a little bit and talk about just this course in general. And I think Abigail said it beautifully about feeling like a professional. What this course has demonstrated to me is, you know, the value of PR practitioners. This is the first time I've really been in a setting that I get to think like a professional and think about what I may be doing in the future. And, you know, the first half of this course, we focused a lot on the food industry, what we were learning you know, about public relations practices and uh, the practices that these major, major corporations uh, were practicing, some may be deemed unethical. There was a lot of, just as uh, Professor de Blasio mentioned, uh, we talked a lot about controversy and handling controversy, but we immediately segued into working with the homeless shelter and learning about all the good that uh, PR can 
provide for the world and organizations like the Emergency Shelter. And um, from the moment uh, Kim Webb, the president of the Emergency Shelter came to visit us, I learned so much about homelessness. I, I'm from you know rural Eastern Kentucky and I moved to Covington. I'm in the heart of Covington and I was a major culture shock for me. And I didn't know anything about these individuals and learning about them and what they've gone through and the services that this shelter is providing for them inspired me. And I, it's, I really wanna do a good job on this project. And the uh, stakeholder group that my uh, group is in charge of is government relations. And when talking with Kim Webb, she spoke mostly about how she wanted to improve community relations. And so I've been challenged with figuring out how improving government relations may meet her needs. So I've been looking into a lot of organizations. Um, one specifically is called Build for Zero. Uh, I've been looking into the communication strategies that they have implemented in order to meet a functional zero population of people experiencing chronic homelessness. And I've been trying to figure out how I may uh, communicate with the shelter on how to communicate with the government entities. Like they're owned by the uh, fiscal court of Kenton County. So my challenge now is to figure out how we are going to implement these communication strategies. I just feel that this work is very valuable and I'm really excited to finish it. And perhaps I'll have more to say once we, you know, really get it on its feet because we are still in the process. And that's all I really have to say. Well, thank you. Thanks a lot. Well, uh, thanks every, every uh, um, to students and uh, uh, faculty for um, these uh, presentations. Uh, the uh, I'll just go uh, real quick to uh, uh, a slide here on um, what is service learning. Uh, uh, NKU has a definition for service learning. You'll see it on the screen there, and I think you can uh, discern from what you have uh, heard from the students that uh, this is in fact what's happening. Uh, uh, Jordan, I like uh, what uh, you said there at the end about uh, uh, the um, uh, meeting the clients uh, sort of amplifies your uh, your commitment to the project. And uh, that's something that you, you hear over and again uh, from students who've had service learning classes. Uh, uh, this is first and foremost for us uh, a learning strategy, a way to, to make uh, the class um, uh, learning outcomes become uh, more real while also delivering something of value to the uh, community. So um, uh, I think uh, from the student perspective, and you've heard it today, is that when you, you learn certain things from lectures and textbooks and uh, other traditional learning and teaching methods, but the chance to apply it in the community makes it uh, more real. Uh, and I know a couple of you have said also about the value of um, uh, just feeling like a professional, which is, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're about to move into that world and this is uh, preparation for that. Other things that I think we've heard today are uh, the value of uh, learning to work as a team. Uh, uh, at the university, we major in what we major in and we often work individually, uh, but more and more education involves uh, teamwork and once you move into the professional world and work, you'll be working in uh, teams and uh, with applied uh, applying your learning. So service learning is intended to, uh, to deliver uh, uh, the experience uh, with those things. Uh, the, um, I don't uh, see any uh, questions in the chat, but before we close out, I'm just gonna, uh, I could go back uh, to Kevin Mente and to Greg de Blasio for any uh, uh, final thoughts on uh, uh, the value from uh, the perspective of a professor of using this teaching uh, strategy. Greg, you want to go first, or uh, sure? There I am. I think I'm. I think I'm audible now. <laughs> yeah, it. Um, it, it you know, it, it's it's a struggle to. Um, kind of get get real. I mean, I hate to use the you know vernacular talk here, but 
Um, if we talk about, let's say, the cases and campaigns class, yeah, there's a there's a really neat textbook that goes through all this stakeholder theory stuff and gives you you know little two page case summaries and things like that. But even putting that course together, the reason why we talk about the food industry is because um, it, it's it's an industry that we all deal with one way or the other, and it gives us a chance throughout the course of the semester to kind of jump into um, the public relations activity for one um, one industry, you know, as as deeply as we want to, and they're, and they you know point out that there's a lot of um, uh, organizations that challenge what food manufacturers are doing, and that work is important because our health is at stake. So, for example, there was a story in today's Guardian about many of the products that are sold in dollar stores here in the U.S. Um, are just filled with the most dangerous chemicals. The plastic bottles that contain the shampoos and other products, just extremely dangerous. I'll let you guys, you know, do the research. And, you know, and it's a shame because the last meeting that we had this morning, we were talking about uh, community relations and some of the things that we should have our eyes on. And, you know, we all had to admit, at least in the groups that, that I uh, participated with, was that the, a lot of the social safety net is just shattered right now. And, and to really feel that you're helping people is, is a challenge. And then, so you think that, okay, well, there's this stuff in the dollar store and here's some professor at NKU is gonna go out and shouting saying, well, you know, you shouldn't buy stuff in the dollar store because it's got dangerous chemicals in it. You know, it, it has a, it has a um, I don't know, an insincere kind of note to it because really not doing much about it. So when we get to meet a client face to face, it's it's not just the value to the community, but it, it's an experience that um, that you know we think about all the college classes that we have, all the different programs and majors at NKU. And mostly when you look at the learning objectives or the way a syllabus is constructed, constructed, it's what you expect the students to do. Um, when a student is faced with a client, the table gets turned around. And, and, you know, at first, I think students are a little shocked because it's like, well, now guess what? You're telling your client what to do. And as a professor, as an instructor, I trust you 100%. I, I have to. So I, I use a professional model of I'm an account executive. I brought this client to you. I brought this client to you because I know that you can do good work. So the idea that you can put uh, that much faith, you know, in your students, that you can put um, that much faith, you know, after some vetting and discussion in someone that wants to be what we call a class client is, is a completely unique experience and, and makes um, the, the entire program more real. And, and as I implied in the beginning, uh, when, when I was talking before, um, this is the class that deals with clients, but it, it has occurred in the past that we have had clients in public relations writing and public relations account management and things like that. And every single time, it's a valuable, valuable experience. And, and I'm happy to hear, you know, when I get the chance to hear feedback from my students that it, it does mean something to them, because I'm, I'm telling you, it always means something to the clients. So, so I'm just overjoyed to be able to participate in teaching and learning in this way. That was really well said, Greg. And um, I guess we're all just playing piggyback. <laughs> and I think I know that the students really enjoyed the project and I wanna thank them again for uh, talking to you guys about it. I think that they did a tremendous job. And I always like to do this in my classes, in my um, materials and techniques classes. And remember, a semester is 16 weeks, and we basically just crank these things out in two weeks. So what, uh, what we're talking about is only an eighth of the entire semester for for, for, for this class. And I think um, every time that I teach it or going into the future, the next time I teach the class, 
I think I'm going to allow for a little bit more time for the community or a client to talk to the students. And I think that they'll be more vested in the project than they already are. I think they, they, they find the rewards later on after they deliver the deliverables that they're really excited about, about how the community embraces what they've made. But I think if I could go back in time and if, if there's a way I could make time and I will the next time I teach the class, I think I will have some sort of presentation by the clients. And I think the students will become even more invested in the project. And I think the outcomes will be even more rewarding for the, the students. So that's kind of what I'm uh, leaving you guys with. I think it's always better to give more than we receive. And I, I think that this is a type of activity that really is rewarding because of that. Well, thank you and thanks everybody. Thanks to uh, th thank the audience for tuning in. I remind you this is Experiential Learning Week at NKU and there are more of these sessions, including one this afternoon on uh, work at the uh, Chase College of Law. Uh, so you can see that uh, uh, schedule on the Experiential Learning uh, website. I wanna especially thank the students who are with us today. Uh, your testimonials were powerful about the value of this. Uh, those of us in uh, faculty and staff uh, at the university believe in this work, but hearing from you about uh, the value of it uh, reinforces our commitment to it. Uh, we are sort of, uh, Jordan, uh, kind of like the uh, uh, when we meet you, we're meeting the client and it uh, in, uh, emboldens our passion for, for trying to uh, keep this uh, uh, happening. And I re uh, remind everybody, uh, whatever, uh, however you are, are looking at this, whether it's student or faculty or a community member that you can communicate with us at engage at NKU. Uh, the, um, uh, we believe that this is uh, an approach to teaching and there is research to uh, back this up that uh, helps uh, um, uh, amplify the learning outcomes and prepare uh, our students for uh, um, their careers. And I want to say also to students that um, uh, I am in the community engaging with clients and potential clients uh, often. And what I hear is, wow, there's a lot of talent at NKU and they are talking about you all. So thanks for sharing that talent with the community. And thanks for being with us today, everybody, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you.